Good morning. Welcome to this webinar. I'm Stuart Henshaw and I'm the Business Development Director at Integrated Skills. Thanks very much for joining us this morning. Today we're looking at the government's resources and waste strategy. Um, any of you remember that? Um, we've got with us two speakers this morning um, to, who are joining us. First, we're going to welcome back Victoria Hutchin, who a year ago um, was with us and outlined um, what was actually in the strategy, what we could expect coming up. Um, Victoria's agreed to return uh, a return visit this morning to update us and provide us with a review of actually what progress has been made. Obviously, it's been a very busy year in politics, and uh, I'm sure the government's priorities have been focused very much on, on some other issues. Um, but there has been progress being made, and Victoria is going to give us a, a really helpful update on that. Um, um, it, in that interim period, I ought to just mention, Victoria has become a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Waste Management. So uh, congratulations, Victoria. Also this morning, we have with us Sarah Knapp, who is very well known in the UK as a leader in the topic of waste composition analysis. Um, we, Sarah's agreed to give us a few minutes of her time to discuss why waste composition analysis should be an important part these days of local authority planning and particularly uh, when local authorities are preparing f how they're going to respond to the government's resources strategy. So, so more of that later from Sarah. Um, a quick preview of next month's webinar, which will be on the 27th of March, same time. Um, same place, but we'll be hearing from Paul Frith uh, of Frith Resource Management. Many of you might know of Paul, um, but he'll be discussing local government service approaches. Um, we were going to talk uh, prior to the election uh, something a little bit ab about the politics of, of waste management and how it's approached, but actually in the light of the election, um, we've we've um, agreed that Paul would be looking at something which I think is really interesting. It's, it's this whole idea of, of how local authorities are going to approach their provision of services. Are they going to look at in-house provision, out-of-house commercialization options for waste collection and wider environmental services? That was going to be a really interesting uh, session. Um, I've known Paul for many years. He's a real thinker and, and leader on this kind of stuff. He provides this advice in his consultancy role within Frith Resource Management. Um, so anyone in your authority looking at, at even thinking about commercialization, how could we commercialize our services, really should be um, logging in for that webinar. And we'll be sending out the invites to that a couple of weeks before. Um, a program for today. Um, First, we have Victoria Hutchin, um, who's going to be, be speaking to us um, for 20 minutes, uh, updating us on the resources strategy. And then we'll be followed by Sarah, who will be talking, as I mentioned, about waste composition analysis and the relevance of that to the waste resources strategy. Um, we've then got a Q&A session uh, with both. So um, please be thinking about questions. Please uh, send through your questions on the, the Q&A uh, tab at the bottom right of the screen, uh, and we'll try and get those questions into the session. If you have a question that actually we don't get time to, to consider during the webinar session, or if you think of something after the, the webinar itself, then please get in touch with us. Um, we'll ask uh, Victoria and Sarah to feel those questions. We'll send those together with the details and the presentation and also the recording we can send those out with the answers to questions so please don't go away if you've got a question you feel is is unanswered please let us know what the question is and we'll we'll make sure that we get that back to you and circulate it to everyone who's listening in so i uh, have no more to say at this stage uh, but to welcome victoria um victoria thank you very much for joining us again for uh, volunteering to come back and uh, update us. Since we last spoke, not only have you become a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Waste Management, but you've also changed jobs. You're now uh, working for Serco in a new role. You might say something, hopefully you'll say something about that new role um, as we go through. But um, thank you very much. Uh, we're looking forward to the presentation on the update. What can we, ex what, what's, hap what's been happening and what is quite a tumultuous political uh, 12 months. So uh, we're all ears and looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Victoria. Thanks, Stuart. Um, I just want to say thanks very much for uh, joining the webinar today and for, environment, uh, for, uh, for invi inviting me along um, to speak on the resources and waste management strategy. 
um, sort of a year on from its publication. Um, so I suppose the latest kind of development uh, this week has been that the Environment Bill has uh, has had its second reading and it's expected to pass that and then it will go forward um, to the next stage of the sort of signing process, um, which is where it goes to scrutiny at the committee. Um, and as we haven't heard any sort of significant queries or concerns as yet raised around the uh, waste elements of that, I think it's fair to assume that everything that I go forward to cover today um, you know, is, is as current as it can be at this moment in time. Um, so just a bit about me. So um, I've been in the waste sector for the last 13 years um, and I've recently joined Serco as a business development manager. So I'll be working on bidding for local authority contracts um, covering waste and recycling, street cleansing, grounds maintenance um, and other allied environmental services. So this is just a little bit about Serco's direct services. So mostly providing um, local authority services, um, you know, the frontline public realm and public facing services. Um, and if you ever look at some of these uh, sort of brief stats here, um, we provide waste and recycling collections to 2.5 million people. So that gives you sort of an idea of the scale of our business. So in terms of what I'm going to cover today, so I'm going to look at the key changes that the strategy might bring, um, what has happened really in the last 12 months since its publication, um, when these changes are likely to come in and be implemented, what the impacts of these might be, and also how these impacts might be mitigated as local authorities. So a series of consultations were held last year, just to give you a little bit of information on some of these, um, the consistency consultation had over 1,700 responses and 241 of those were from local authorities. And then the plastic tax consultation had a record 162,000 responses. Um, and I think this is partly due to the sort of the David Attenborough um, blue planet effect with people becoming more aware of the impacts of uh, plastics on our, on our oceans and environments. So I've picked out some of the key things that um, are likely to impact local authorities coming out of the strategy. Um, so the first one is a deposit return scheme. So the draft environment bill provides the legislative framework to implement a deposit return scheme. And effectively, as most of you probably already know, this is around paying a deposit at the point of purchase, which is then returned when you bring the container back for recycling. Um, the draft bill sets out some of the more specific information on proposed deposits and targets, which are set out here on the slide. Um, so that's the four kind of material types that are likely to be included within the scheme and also the ramping up of performance targets in terms of the amount of material that should be recycled through the scheme um, as it's as it's implemented. Um, so extended producer responsibility. So this is around producers being responsible for funding the management of packaging at the end of its life. And this is what we, we're sort of referring to as the full net cost of recovery. Um, it's also likely that this money um, flowing back into the system from producers will then be used in some way to form, to provide a funding mechanism to support local authority frontline services. Um, but it's not quite clear at the moment how that system will work and how that money might flow back um, to individual local authorities. But the general feeling is that this is likely to be tied, as in the funding is likely to be tied to local authorities meeting um, defined service standards for their waste and recycling collection services. And I'll go on to explain that in a little bit more detail in a moment. So these minimum service standards so the government has stated that it's looking at setting minimum standards for local authority service, collection services in England. And as I said, it's, it's generally felt that any funding will likely be tied to meeting those service standards. So the proposed approach is that there'll be a consistent suite of core materials collected at the curbside. Um, and that this will include weekly separate food waste collections. Um, and then there's also some debate around whether it, or what impact that might have on local authorities that currently collect food and garden waste combined. 
Um, it's not clear at the moment whether they could continue to do that on a fort because many are on a fortnightly basis, whether they can continue to do that and then supplement that with a weekly food collection on the alternate week, or whether actually they would need residents to present those materials separately as two streams at the curbside. Because um, evidence does show that if you collect food waste separately from garden waste, you will collect more, more of the food waste. Um, but this is likely to be subject to further consultation because um, it's also tied to the provision of potential free garden waste collection for all. Um, and that particular element within the consultations uh, raised a lot of concerns from local authorities, um, particularly those who have a chargeable service at the moment, is actually what the impacts would be of suddenly then having to provide a free service to everyone um, who has gardens. And also the fact that only those who have gardens could have access to that service. So if you're an authority with quite a high proportion of flatted properties, then actually only a relatively small proportion of your population could actually have access to that service anyway. And then it's whether that's best use of, you know, public funding and public money and taxpayers' money if actually it's not a service that's available to all. So in terms of the implementation, um, hopefully everyone can see the detail on this slide, but this is a slide that's been taken from the Waste and Resources Strategy, which kind of sets out um, the timeline uh, for the various implementation of the different, of the different parts of the, of the Waste and Resources Strategy. And actually much of the changes that are likely to affect local authority frontline services um, start to be implemented from 2023. So in terms of what does this all mean? So one key thing, which I've touched on already, is material consistency. So the core suite of materials are set out there on the slide, um, which I think are pretty much what people expected, glass, paper, card, plastic bottles, pot stubs and trays, um, and steel, aluminium, steel and aluminium cans. But the government has also stated within its response to the consultations that this may also include cartons and plastic film. Um, but that further consideration of the impacts of that is required, particularly around materials recycling facilities, because film particularly is known to cause some issues um, in terms of it getting wrapped around bits of the machinery within a, within a MRF. Um, and actually what additional infrastructure or equipment might be needed to, to roll that out universally, because there are a lot of the authorities who probably use MRFs that can't currently accept that material because they don't have any means of effectively extracting it from the other co-mingled materials. So that element is also up for, for, for debate. And the same is kind of true of cartons. When it goes through a MRF, it looks the same as a cardboard box and actually it needs a separate different treatment route. So it's it then can potentially become an issue because of it contaminating other material streams going for you know going forward and leaving the facility and actually we know from the current materials market that that's a particular problem material quality and actually cross-contamination of other recyclates as much as contamination with non-recyclates so it's it's likely that that might form part of the consultations that, that come out later this year also within the government's um, response on material consistency there appeared to be a softening of its stance on separate collections. Um, and it's quite, I suppose, quite stark to see that only 23% of local authorities who responded to the consultation, so 23% of that 241, um, were actually in favour of separate collections being mandatory. Um, and I think that's just because we know at the moment we have a vast array of different collection systems at the curbside. And there's a lot of invested infrastructure and plant and equipment and people and fleet um, that's already in place to deliver those services, um, many of which have a lifetime and a longevity well beyond 2023. So the question is what happens to all of, the, all of that sunk cost, both financially and environmentally going forward. Um, it's also important to note that the TEAP test will still apply. This is set out within the draft environment bill um, and it does, also include food now in that list of items and it's likely that there'll be stricter definitions and clearer guidance coming from the government in terms of what TEEP actually means 
Um, and also there was some discussion about whether the environmental, the E out of the technically, environmentally and economically practicable, practicable the um, economic part, whether that would continue to be, um, you know, part of the assessment going forward, because there was a concern that many local authorities would default to the cheapest collection solution. And actually, if the funding mechanism for providing those services is slightly different and it is coming from producers, then should we be going for the best environmentally practicable solution rather than the cheapest solution? Um, but as the wording currently stands, the economic element is, is still in there. So linked to the previous slide, um, food and garden waste collections. So it's quite clear that the government intends to legislate for the separate collection of food waste. Um, this is included within the draft environment bill and it is the separate weekly collection. Um, but there's likely to be further consideration around the co-collection of food and garden waste. Because I said previously, there are still quite a number of authorities who co-collect food and garden waste. Um, and, you know, they deem that to be the most cost effective way of doing that at that time. Um, and it's also linked to the treatment route that that material goes to. Um, so there's a question mark about, well, what, you know, what does that mean? Could they bring in a weekly food if the food and garden was fortnightly? or do they need to separate those two streams entirely? The proposals also, um, or also sorry, sorry, the cons consultations going forward, um, the government stated that it intends to look further at the costs and benefits of providing free caddy liners, um, or, or local authorities providing the free caddy liners to residents. Um, and it may or may not make that a requirement, depending on what its findings are on the costs and benefits. Um, and also there's a statement that they'll work with local authorities to take account of local circumstances and their feasibility. So this is likely to include, um, you know, particular types of properties where providing a separate food waste collection might be quite challenging. So if, for example, where you have um, flats above shops where they present all of their waste in sacks, it would be quite difficult for them to then present a food caddy on the street because where do you return that caddy to? And will it be there at the end of the day when they get home from work? And also in very rural areas, um, there may also be some flex on or whether or not the separate food waste collect collection requirement um, would need to be implemented. And there was also the government's kind of initial stance on garden waste um, was that it should be offered as a minimum fortnightly and free to all properties with gardens. Um, but the consultation responses on garden waste um, being free for all were generally not supportive of that being made a statutory requirement. And the government has acknowledged this in its response to those consultations um, and has stated that it intends to consider the costs and benefits further uh, before making a final decision on this matter. So free garden waste is effectively still up for debate. So deposit return scheme. Um, the Draft Environment Bill, as I stated previously, um, sets out the powers to introduce a DRS system. Um, the government will likely to be watching to see what happens in Scotland and how it works and you know what the impacts are. And the Scottish legislation on that is, is kind of imminent. Um, some supermarkets are already trialling their own schemes. And actually Tesco um, was doing reverse vending for plastic bottles and cans, I think it was, um, in exchange for club card points back in 2006. Um, and actually one of the reasons they stopped doing it um, was because people um, fraudulently fudged the system, <laughs> if you like, um, and were doing things like cutting up plastic bottles into four pieces and claiming four times the amount of club card points. Um, so I think they found it quite difficult to administer. Um, but Iceland, has become one of the first supermarkets to trial proper reverse vending machines in their stores and that was in 2018 and Sainsbury's announced just last month that it would be introducing five deposit return schemes to recycle plastic bottles in exchange for a five pence per item coupon towards their shopping. That's all well and good for the big supermarkets um, but it's not actually clear how it would work for smaller producers um, with limited storage to take back these materials. 
And there's also the question around what impact that would have on material available at the curbside and therefore income and costs for local authorities. Um, because certain curbside costs are fixed. So you have a minimum collection resource that will be required to collect the remaining recyclables um, from all properties. And then you've got things like admin management overhead, um, which are kind of embedded your assets and your infrastructure and also your contractual terms. You know, you might be in a contract that has certain requirements, both in terms of your material collection, but also for your material processing and disposal. And actually what impacts might there be um, if you've got less material to collect and who's going to pay the costs of, uh, you know, of those shortfalls. So extended producer responsibility, I think, you know, as I stated previously, it's not clear, quite clear how any funding might flow back through the system. Um, but the strategy does state that any new duties for local authorities to meet the requirements of the, of the waste strategy and, and the legislation coming out of that um, will be assessed to account for new burdens and funded appropriately. So it's likely that the extended producer responsibility system would involve some sort of modulated fee for producers. So if you produce a product that's easier to recycle uh, or the packaging is easier to recycle, then you're likely to play, pay less to place that product on the market as your fee than if you had a product that was very difficult to recycle. So the idea is that the, Im the impact of that should be that it would encourage greener product with design over time um, because you know if you're a producer and you can produce a more environmentally friendly packaging then it should cost you less um, you know in, in fees to um, pay for your extended producer responsibility. And then there is a question around could consumers see a double hit in terms of cost increases on products? One to cover this extended producer responsibility fee if you like um, because we're not expecting that producers will pay for this out of the goodness of their own hearts. Um, and also one to cover the deposit. And although the deposit is refundable at the point of returning of that container, it's still something that people have to finance upfront at the point of purchase. So in terms of the impacts, so for the sort of campaign or the, the plan for greater material consistency, um, one of the significant things is that there could be changes or there will be changes to curbside collection systems and we're not just talking about food waste here for example i live in author if, live in an authority area um, that doesn't collect mixed plastics doesn't collect glass and doesn't collect food waste at the curbside and we also have a chargeable garden waste scheme so if all of those things came out as originally planned in terms of increasing the core collection suite of materials, separate food waste and free garden waste, then obviously my local authority has got some significant challenges in terms of how they make all of that happen. Um, and sort of what the time frame for that is, because you know the changes will come in 2023 and they sort of stated that if you're not in a contract and you're a, um, you know, you've got your services in house, then there should be no reason that you can't implement those changes from 2023. So it's quite a significant challenge for, for, for a number of authorities. In terms of deposit return schemes, it's not quite clear yet how this will be administered and whether it will be, uh, and whether it will be managed, for example, through a single producer compliance scheme, multiple schemes, whether the government will set up its own entity to manage this, and what role local authorities may or may not have in administering the system. So it's quite difficult at the moment to assess what the impact might be on the material at the curbside without knowing how the material and the will be collected and how the deposits will be funded back to the people. In terms of extended producer responsibility, um, it, it's likely that this will have an impact on the mix of the materials at the curbside with potentially um, organisations switching to materials that are easy, easier to recycle. I mean, anecdotally, I've already heard that people have started to see an increase in um, drinks, like water even, being in cans rather than being in plastic bottles. Um, 
I think partly because of the backlash against plastics, but also because a bottle is made up of your core bottle, then a different type of plastic for the cap, and then it's usually wrapped. Whereas a can, it's a single material and everything's printed on the on the metal itself. Um, so it might lead to some, yes, yeah, some, some innovation in product design. And in terms of timeframes, well, it's likely, I mean, I've got early 2020 on there for consultations. Well, I think we're a bit delayed on that, given the, uh, the other political issues, Brexit and uh, the general election at the end of last year. But we are still anticipating that probably by summer that we should have um, some further consultation on the detail and the and the potential options in terms of administration of these different um, changes and that then the changes are likely to actually come about and be implemented um, from 2023. So in terms of mitigating these impacts, so some of the key things are working in partnership with your service providers um, to understand what the impacts might be and this isn't just you know whether your services are insourced or outsourced um, because you know even if you do manage your services in-house you're still likely to have contracts or arrangements you know if you're a collection authority you'll have arrangements with your waste disposal authority around you know how those materials are are collected and disposed of um, so it's looking at the potential impacts in terms of costs um, and also your contract flexibility. So what mechanisms have you got within your existing contract um, to respond to these changes and bring in contract variations? It's also looking at things like the optimization and efficiency of your existing resources and how adaptable they are to accept the additional materials that might need to be collected to meet material consistency. So as I was saying for the local authority, I currently reside in um, I have a commingled collection so if they, that then needed to introduce mixed plastics and glass or potentially glass separate or I don't know paper separate but some different configuration of the materials is there some you know rerouting re-optimization um, that you could do to maximize the efficiency of your existing resources um, you know without having to look at redesigning the whole thing you know, could you move to different working hours, different working arrangements? Um, because a lot of local authorities will have assets and systems that will be in place at the moment that have a life that goes well beyond 2023. It's also um, looking at new procurements. So if you're in the process of procuring contracts at the moment, it's developing and designing the contract documentation um, with an appropriate risk share within there in terms of how you would respond to the changes between you know both yourselves as a local authority and as the contractor and then also putting in place appropriate change mechanisms and this can actually include getting options for things um, costed up front so food waste is a classic one that we're increasingly seeing um, local authorities asking for a price for at the point of procurement because you know, it's in the draft environment bill, it's significantly likely to happen. Um, okay, we don't know how the funding mechanism is going to work for that, but it's a foreseeable change. Um, so getting that costed up front can make it a lot easier in terms of procurement regulations when you do actually need to bring that service change in. And it's also about local authorities and organisations um, actively participating in the next round of consultations. Because you know, if you're not a participant in that, then you're sort of foregoing your opportunity to um, to have your opinions heard. And these ones are going to be all about refining the detail of how this all actually practically works. So um, you know, they could be much more impactful and important than the the previous round in a lot of ways. Because this is all about okay, we've got these conceptual ideas, but how do they actually work on a practical level? Um, yeah, so I think that's really important um, going forward. Um, so that's about it from me. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone for your time um, in listening to listening to the presentation. And um, I think we are we planning to jointly hold um, questions after both presentations. We are. We'll be. Uh, you'll, you're hopefully going to stay with us, Victoria, and we'll have a Q and A at the end. So those of you who have been li listening in, um, please. Um, 
get your questions down in the Q and A section at the bottom right in the bottom. Um, thanks, Victoria. That was really interesting. Really interesting and and um, surprising in a way. There's still a, a number of key questions that government uh, are still working on the detail um, to. Um, we're already about to enter March 2020, and and uh, my my kind of take on on what you've said there is that 2023 is just seeming incredibly near um, with so much to do, um, so much to still work through. Um, uh, I think your presentation really nicely uh, links us into uh, Sarah Knapp, who's our next speaker. Um, Sarah Knapp has got 16 years of experience of at, um, waste um, composition analysis work. Uh, we've worked with Sarah for a number of years, and uh, recently we've been doing some really in interesting projects where there are clear, clear links to, to um, what, what you've been talking about, Victoria, um, in in really analysing the waste streams that your local authorities are currently um, working with. And just just to um, uh, kind of a bit of a bit of a pers personal view. Um, uh, waste composition analysis for me in the past has been very much about okay, working out how much recycling we're generating, how much residual waste we're generating, possibly how much garden waste. What I've been finding really interesting working with Sarah recently with, with some clients is actually um, how sophisticated um, the, 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 it's, we're, we're able to be in terms of not just seeing what, what are the right materials in the right place, but actually what are the wrong materials um, in, in the other waste streams. So, you know, looking at the stats on how much food is actually still being produced but actually not in the food waste stream it's actually in the residual stream or you know how much re re recycler is actually being generated but actually is still in the residual waste stream for example and you know how much contamination in recycling so um and um i know sarah will come on to this dis describe some of those in more detail but um no i, I i'm really thinking that um, waste composition analysis is, is, although it's been very useful over the years, I think it's still that's the um, coming of age, and it's something that authorities will want to get more and more involved in um, in the future. So, um, Sarah, on that uh, point, I will hand over to you. I will firstly just uh, add your presentation, and um, then I will hand over to yourself to take us through waste composition analysis and measuring process progress towards the resources strategy. Thanks very much, Sarah. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you, Stuart, for introducing me. Um, so um, I, I'd like to take you through an, a number of the aims and targets from the waste strategy this morning and show what waste composition data can actually do to provide you with information to, dis to inform um, decision making. Um, I'm just hoping that um, Beverly and Kathy can hear me. Um, they were saying they couldn't hear Stuart. Um, how do I make my presentation work? Ah. So uh, waste composition. Waste composition analysis um, provides data at many, many different levels and it can feed into planning processes, um, your procurement, um, mainly strategic decision making, of course. Um, but it can also help you with um, setting targets and key performance indicators and then monitoring progress towards those. Are you going to be able to reach them? How far have you got? How far are you away? And what can be done to change things? So basically, if you know what you're dealing with, you will also know what is feasible and what is not feasible. So waste composition in a nutshell, um, it can a waste composition analysis study can be set up in a week and then take two weeks in the field and another couple of weeks to look at data and write a report. Um, it depends on the size of the project and what you're trying to achieve. But the basic steps are you select your sample areas or your level or units of sampling, you collect your samples, you might want to take a subsample, then you sort, weigh, record the data, analyze the data, um, write a report and present the results. Very, very simple process. Where do the samples come from? All municipal um, waste has been analyzed and we, we do analyze it all. So it could be from the curbside, um, at the moment, we're looking more and more at um, 
um, householders who live in flats who have communal bins and, and how you can look at what, what's in the composition of what they're producing, the weights they're producing, how you can help flatted households recycle. HWRCs, litter bins, bulky waste, I mean, basically any municipal waste stream. Um, so the next slide shows um, a, a team working in the field. Uh, this is a very large team. As you can see, their um, samples of, of, of waste are hand sorted. So it's very much a manual handling task. Uh, health and safety is utmost in our minds at all times. So the waste is sorted, weighed off, and then placed into skips for disposal. So at the end of each day, the site is tidied down. Everything is sent off for disposal. So um, this presentation is it, we're going to look at how waste composition analysis data can help you achieve some of the aims and targets within DEFRA's waste strategy. So as Victoria's already gone through all of them, they're just outlined here, the ones that I thought would be pertinent. So the deposit return scheme, um, extended producer respond, uh, responsibility, including the additional streams that are going to be included in that. Um, minimum SATS service standard, which and, and what that means, but also what it means to people who live in flatted households and how the, uh, the, a minimum standard could help people recycle more. Um, the, the municipal recycling targets, um, ways of measuring what can be, um, what can boost reuse at HWRCs. And I think also that those schemes may be uh, rolled out to householders as well at the curbside and methods of improving and measuring improvements to urban recycling rates. It's 12 hours. It's 12 hours. Um, so the deposit return schemes, this I think is perhaps one of the things that will have the biggest impact on curbside recycling um, and it will change the composition, um, removing anything that was a, a drinks container, so cans, plastic bottles and glass bottles. Um, so the waste composition data can show you what you currently are collecting. Um, the composition of your waste and uh, recycling streams. And then it could help you model how a DRS scheme will impact on the composition and the weights you're currently collecting and sending off to be um, to be processed or you know put through a MRF, etc. Um, it will also impact um, on-the-go recycling. Um, so the litter bins that you maybe have just sort of rolled out to collect. Um, recycling on the go um, will be will be possibly greatly impacted by DRS schemes. Um, although work that we carried out in um, one of the universities in Scotland showed that the DRS scheme had absolutely no impact on the litter that was produced by students, but that was a while ago. Extended producer responsibility at the moment packaging. Um, so waste composition data will show you exactly the composition and weights of packaging in each of your waste and recycling streams, whether it's from households, litters, sweepings, commercial, and also at schools and um, sort of other businesses such as schools, colleges, etc., that you are collecting from. Um, the, um, you can then use the composition data to model for uh, the impact of DRS or on, you know, things to target for your recycling and what's being overlooked, etc. Um, the um, additional screen, uh, streams that um, are being considered are textiles, both clothes and household sort of linens, sheets and pillowcases, etc. Furniture, mattresses and carpets. And doing waste composition surveys at um, HWRCs will show you the sort of the weights and, and concentrations of those materials coming through the site, plus doing a survey of site users, you'll see how many people are actually bringing those items in, you know, what, what, how often are, are they arising, what's the volumes, what's the weights, this can help you plan for um, storing these items if they need to be stored or um, on-site, off-site, transporting them, etc. 
and the minimum service standard. So as Victoria said, it's um, um, a consistent set of core dry recyclables. So the waste composition data will show you what it, of those core materials is in your recycling, what is still remaining in your um, residual waste. And between adding these together, you can then work out your capture rates. So you can see what is what is being captured and what is being missed, which types of materials are being missed. Is there a particular reason why householders don't want to recycle those materials? Do they not understand what you know that they are recyclable? But also this sort of survey would show you the um, contamination in your recycling. The strategy has looked at increasing the quantity, but they also want to improve the quality of the recycling that we're producing. The contamination rates will show what's commonly being mistaken as recyclable and provide you with methods of um, in, talking to householders, talking to businesses and making sure that what they recycle is smarter, cleaner recycling. For the food waste, oh, food, food waste collection services at the curbside are incredibly difficult to uh, encourage householders to participate in. The work we've done in Guernsey, I'm, they achieved amazing participation rates in their food waste scheme, but it involved a huge amount of work and ambassadors talking to householders, etc. Um, the, the, a food waste scheme collected weekly um, will have, a, have some impact on your residual waste, but uh, a waste composition data will show you what is still remaining in your residual waste and what is being recycled. What percentages are avoidable and unavoidable? Could we look at um, reducing food waste in the first place? What sort of material, what sort of food waste is being wasted? Is it avoidable? Could householders be shown different ways of not overbuying, not overcooking? etc to reduce the food waste in the first place and then what ha what is unavoidable getting that diverted into a food waste scheme um the the, the strategy talks about um separate weekly collections <clears throat> and weekly collections do in my opinion will um improve participation rates because householders absolutely hate having food waste hanging about I think a, a, a fortnightly service would see food waste put out one week and when it's not collected, it gets put in the residual waste bin. Liners, in my opinion, massively improve the amount of participation and capture of food waste. Um, it removes some of the yuck factor. Um, so the, uh, the waste composition data will show you what is being put into the separate collection and, and what is not being um, recycled. It will also show you the impact on the residual waste stream, the volumes and weights, how that is changed by diverting food waste. And if commingled um, garden food waste schemes are allowed to carry on, the composition analysis data will show you the percentage of food within that stream, and that will enable you to report your diversion rates. Uh, municipal waste recycling targets. Um, waste composition data will actually show you the likelihood of your, your area being able to um, achieve those targets. What is in, in the waste? What is in the recycling? Is it actually possible to achieve those targets? It may not be. Um, capture rates for targeted materials. It will show you what the capture rates are and perhaps you know, introduce ideas to you of how you could capture more. Um, it will also show you additional materials that you may want to consider targeting. The, core, the five core, obviously, are going to be introduced anyway, but there may be additional things that you need to introduce to capture more, um, divert more waste into the recycling streams. And as I keep saying, the composition data shows you the, the levels and types of contamination in your recycling and will then supply you with information on how you can persuade householders and businesses not to put those contaminants in their bins. So, yes, if, if you know the composition of your waste, you know 
how you can manage it and what you can potentially achieve because it's not always that you can achieve the targets that are set for you. Boosting reuse at HWRCs. Um, although a lot of HWRCs already have sort of on-site sh shops, etc., cetera, um, where you can, well, reusable items are diverted into the sort of shop selling area so that uh, um, you, you can also purchase um, sort of your, your second hand or whatever items from, from the same site, but not many sites have that. Um, I think the, the waste composition analysis at an HWRC will show you the weights, volumes and types of materials that could be diverted into a reuse scheme or remanufacture schemes. Um, a visitor by visitor survey will show you the how often the items occur. You know, how many times a day does somebody bring in a table that could have been diverted into a reuse scheme? And then that will help you understand the sort of space, storage space, um, um, volumes, etc., needed to store these items. Plus, if they're going off site, the, the transport um, that you'll need to get them to wherever they need to go next. So we move on from there. This is actually my last slide and is looking more at um, how to improve urban recycling rates. Waste composition in, in flats or households with communal bins are notoriously difficult to manage um, and get participation rates in increased and um, capture rates, etc. But uh, waste composition survey will show you the weights and volumes in, in each bin. Um, have you got enough space in your recycling bins? Work we've just recently carried out showed that there was there was plenty of space in the bins for residual waste because there was an adequate number of them, but the recycling bins were invariably full. And once the bins were full, recycling was then just placed in the residual waste bins. So it's knowing that sort of that minimum service standard of, of providing the right volume for, for each waste stream. Um, the composition data will show you the composition of weights from the, the block of flat, flats or the number of flats using a particular bin store. Um, it will show the capture rates, um, contamination again, and it, it will show you what is achieve, achievable from each of those areas, what can be achieved in you know, flatted areas and what's not achievable, etc. So, um, well, um, that's all I have to say at the moment, um, but I hope that that's plenty of food for thought. <laughs> and uh, yes, if any well, questions, I'm happy to help. Thank you, Sarah, I like, your, I like the pun. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thanks, Stuart. We've got, um, we've got a question from Bryn. Um, let me just add that onto the... If I can just make that public. Uh, Okay. All right. Just bear with me two seconds, folks. Um, I thought that was, um, I, I think that's been a really, really good morning. And thanks very much, both of you, for those um, presentations, which have been really interesting. Um, I am going to just uh, open this up and, and read this out from Brins. For some reason, that doesn't seem to be um, I was switching on. But then I'm going to read it. So, so Bryn's asking, how relevant is waste composition analysis to waste planning authorities for local plan development? Are the resources required prohibit prohibitive? And is there any evidence that it leads to more confidence, leading to more private sector in infrastructure uh, investment? As the analysis is a snapshot in time, could it therefore be subject to challenge by the public and consultees in terms of relevance as the plan progresses? Sarah, have you ever had any any involvement in actually your work going through to sort of local plan development, to looking at planning waste resources uh, in the in the long term? Um, and could you say something about what you think about the snapshot in time? The challenge that actually what you're doing is you're just looking at you know over a short period of time and some of these strategic requirements and maybe over a number of years any thoughts on that uh, yes um yes uh, waste comp is a snapshot in time um the authorities that um are, are using it for 
well, different authorities use it for different reasons. So um, if um, an authority who wants to see whether a um, recycling scheme is, is working um, will not worry so much about it being a snapshot in time because it, it's do a before you roll out and then after you roll out um, waste comp exercise and it will give you a very good idea of whether the scheme is actually working or not. Um, we've done a number of those over many years and now we're doing more and more as people roll out their food waste schemes. Um, for long term um, planning, um, authorities that use waste comp for that will normally do more than one analysis. They will do um, maybe four seasons and, and look at how, how that is changing over time. Um, and then they will may, maybe also sort in batches so that you have a greater number of samples, which you can do greater statistical analysis on to show how close your, your data is to a norm, to something that is realistic. So um, I don't have a great deal of experience of um, local plan development, but um, I think anybody that was feeding in data from a waste comp will would need to seriously think about the snapshot and each snapshot in time and decide whether uh, you know the, the number of samples they need to take per period will give them sufficient data to look at um, sort of standard deviation and that sort of um, analytical content so that you can be certain of what you that what you're saying is reasonable. Sarah, the other the other um, added value that I, I that comes to mind when we're talking about this is sort of the, the strategic period of time question and waste composition analysis being just a moment is I know that in the work that you've done um, over a number of years now you actually are able to access the, the previous waste analysis uh, results and actually do a sort of compare and contrast and look at trends over time. So um, you know, I guess I guess if it's just a one-off project, but if it's part of a whole series of um, projects that have been done over a number of years, then actually yes. you can see a strategic, uh, you know, line, see where trends are going. Absolutely, um, yes. I think for yeah. um, what some of the offshore work we do, um, we've been working with one particular authority for ten years, carrying out waste and waste comp sort of every every year, maybe, and sometimes two seasons. And with their data, you can see this progression over time. So it's no longer just a snapshot. It is, it's, it's, it's providing them with some, you know, the level of quality of data that is uh, yeah. sufficiently robust for their requirements. Yeah. And, and, you know, any data that you've got on waste composition is better than a guess, isn't it? Let's face oh, it. Oh, my gosh, yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Yes, yes. Better than the in the air job. Thank you. Any any other questions from those of you who are, who are attending? I've got a question for Victoria, which is um, is really about more about the sort of the detail of, of. I'm not asking you to answer how how government's legislative program is set up because I know it's a sort of a bit of a, a, a mystery to to um, to even MPs themselves about you know how they prioritise legislation. Um, but have you got anything you could say about the legislative programme and uh, or where people could go to kind of keep up to date with progress on on the resources strategy and, and how, you know, what the latest developments are and have been? That's Victoria. Yeah, sorry. I was sorry. <laughs> I was trying to unmute myself. Um, yeah, I think the important thing really is um, keeping an eye out for the next round of consultations. Um, and we can probably find the link for that to share with people that are attending the call today. Um, just because that's that's really, I mean, I suppose it's two things. It's it's what tracking the development of the Environment Bill as that progresses through the various stages of, um, of Parliament and um, committees and sign off. And also, yeah, it's it's looking out for the consultations and being, you know, actively part of responding to those because I think some of the specifics around the mechanisms for deposit return and extended producer responsibility are likely to be outlined within those consultations. Um, and I think summer is the sort of time we're expecting those, those to come out subject to any other political upheaval <laughs> in the meantime. Hmm. Um, but yes, I think those are the main things really. Um, are, yeah, those two points are just watching how those progress and, and actively being part of the consultations. Great, thank you. Um, I 
as we're coming coming towards the end of the the session um i've just got a, a couple of thoughts um uh, and in fact these are thoughts that we'd already had on on top future topics um one was actually just that, that you picked up on it sarah which is the whole idea of boosting reuse at, at hwrc's and um a topic for a future webinar would be actually to hear from some of the authorities who have done the the reuse shops that are linked to um, the hwrc's um whether that's something that's of interest um you know how that was set up what the logistics are what the costs are um um yeah i wonder if you could kind of maybe indicate to us whether that's something that's of, of interest um and the other thing was that something else that um uh is going to be a big issue within the resources strategy is the whole issue of, of, of food waste and um uh, we, we've got a, made contact with a number of people who are involved in, in junk food projects. Um, whether that would be interesting, whether for the, those of you in local authorities who are, uh, maybe you're already connected, but would that be of interest to hear from um, some junk food projects, uh, how they were set up? Um, because I'm feeling like those are the kind of projects that are going to very much fit in with, with the, the new resources strategy when it comes out. Um, Interested if anyone's got any further ideas for topics for future webinars. Uh, I say look out for and put it in your diary. Friday the 27th of March at 11 o'clock, that's Paul Frith, who's going to be talking about those service, um, lo local government service approaches, um, the whole issue of outsourcing, insourcing, and how to commercialize, looking at ways of commu commercializing waste collection and wider environmental services. That's for next month. Um, can I just say thank you very much, Victoria and Sarah, for your time putting together the presentations and spending time uh, with us. Uh, it's been really, really interesting. I hope those of you who've attended have enjoyed it and have got a lot out of it. We'll be sending around uh, the recording of the, the webinar this morning, the presentations, uh, and any of you who actually do come back to us with some future, some additional questions, we'll field those to Victoria and Sarah and send those back out with the, um, the presentation. Finally, thank you very much for attending. Really appreciate you joining us on the webinar. Um, and that's all from us now. So bye for now. Thank you. Goodbye.